There's an old tip that a lot of writers use when telling their stories, enter late and leave early. This is referring to how to write a scene, or a conversation between characters. If you think about a conversation between two people in real life, it usually starts with some pleasantries. Hi, how are you? The weather's nice today. Things like that. Then you get into the actual meat of your conversation, and when you're finished, you usually end with more pleasantries. Goodbye, it was nice to see you, have a good day. Now, those pleasantries that bookend a conversation are expected in real life, but are absolute drivel in storytelling. They don't matter, they're unnecessary, and they worsen the quality of a scene. So the writing tip of enter late, leave early, chops off those unnecessary bits and leaves us with just what we need. Essentially, enter late, leave early just means enter on time, leave on time. And it's the second part of that tip I really want to focus on. Leave on time. Know when the scene has run its course and get the hell out of there. Do not overstay your welcome. Completely unrelated to that, let's talk about whether or not Squid Game needs a season two. If you're somehow out of the loop, Squid Game is a 2021 South Korean drama following a group of down-on-their-luck people who are recruited to play a number of children's games for the chance to win 45 billion won. What they don't know, however, is that losing a game means losing their lives. Squid Game quickly became the most popular show released by Netflix last year, and possibly ever, and for good reason. It's thrilling, it's fast-paced, it's got compelling characters, and it's an unpleasant reminder of complex class structures that keep a lot of people living by the skin of their teeth, always inches away from falling over the edge. If you somehow haven't seen the show, I don't know what to tell you, man. <laughs> I'm about to recap it, so spoiler alert, I guess. Squid Game follows our main character, Song Gi-hoon, who is deep in debt, needs to pay for his mother's surgery, and is on the verge of losing his daughter when he's approached by a mysterious salesman that gives him a business card and the promise of money. He agrees to participate in a series of children's games along with 400 some odd other people, including his childhood best friend Cho Sang-woo, who's wanted for embezzlement, and pickpocket Kang se byuk who's trying to pay for her parents' passage from North Korea to South Korea. Also in the mix is Ali Abdul, a migrant worker and new father whose boss exploits him, and Oh Il-nam, an elderly gentleman with a brain tumor who has a literally nothing to lose. They quickly realize that the games are not as innocent as they seem, since losing usually means getting shot and killed. Obviously that's horrific, and everyone wants to stop, until they're told that the prize for winning all the games is 45 billion won. And now, the threat of death doesn't seem so bad. As the games continue, players drop left and right like flies, some in the games, some at the hands of other players. The players who do survive are always on edge, wondering if they'll be the next victims. The more games go by and the more money that's at stake, the more some players start to lose their humanity, while others fight tooth and nail to hold on to theirs. Overseeing it all is a faceless frontman and the uber-rich VIPs who watch the games for entertainment, and sleuthing behind the scenes is police officer Huang Jun-ho, who's desperate to get justice for his brother and blow this whole operation wide open. Eventually, the only three surviving players are a rattled gi a ruthless Sungwoo and an injured Sebyuk, but not for long. Sebyuk is heartlessly murdered by Sungwoo, which officially breaks the relationship between him and Gihun. So when the two play the final game, the titular Squid Game, they're playing to kill. It's a brutal affair, and just when Gihun is about to end the life of his childhood friend, he decides against it, invoking one of the main rules of the game. If the majority of surviving players agree to stop playing, the games will end. But Sungwoo, with nothing left for him, ends his own life, leaving the 45 billion won to Gihun. A year later, Gion is still living frugally. The bloodshed and trauma that got him 45 billion won is too much for him to face, so the money sits in his bank account, unattached. Gihun is summoned by the creator of the game, who we find out is Oh Il-nam, the sweet old man who apparently died in the fourth game. In reality, Il-nam is a business tycoon who had grown bored with his excessive wealth and sought entertainment that would bring excitement back to his life. Thus, Squid Game was born. Il-nam challenges Gion to one final game. If the homeless man outside doesn't receive help from someone by midnight, it will prove Il-nam's point that man is inherently evil and selfish and he will reclaim all of Gihun's winnings. But just as time is running out, the homeless man does receive help, meaning Gihun won, but not before Il-nam passed away, never seeing that he had lost and that he was wrong. In the final moments of the show, Gihun makes a choice, and decides to use his money to visit his daughter in America. But on his way to the airport, he stops that same salesman from luring more people into the Squid Games, which results in him receiving a call telling him to mind his own business and board his plane. Gihun thinks about it, then turns around and gets off the plane, likely deciding to try his best to take the games down. 
The first season of Squid Game is great. It's a tightly written narrative, it explores specific themes in multiple ways, and it's a standalone limited series. It's effective. It works really well. After watching it, I spent the next little portion of my life watching any and all content I could find about the show, as one does, and there was a lot of discussion of people wanting Squid Game to get another season. And I get it. A lot of people had a very visceral reaction to the show, as did I, and it's only natural for us to want to spend more time in this world with these characters. Or the surviving ones, at least. It's part of our nature, I think. If we get a little bit of something good, we can't help but want more of it. And I'm usually not opposed to the idea of getting more of a good thing, as long as the story warrants it. As long as the quality behind the show can be maintained over multiple seasons. And if television history is any indicator, this is easier said than done. More and more recently, we've seen a rise of shows that get a great reception from audiences, and then go on to get season after season after season, long after the story ever needed it. And inevitably, with each new season that gets made of a certain show, the quality goes downhill as the writers scramble to create a story out of nothing. And yet, instead of simply throwing in the towel and admitting that they should have tied up the show three seasons ago, they just keep pushing and pushing, and it's not pretty. Because it seems like, in this day and age, the worst thing showrunners can think of when it comes to their successful properties is ending them. Them. Because when you end a show that's bringing in millions, you're suddenly not making millions anymore. Funny how that works. And look, I understand wanting to make money, alright? We live in a society that runs on making money, so of course it seems counterproductive to do anything that'll disrupt your paycheck. Ending a show does just that. Except, it might feel even worse than losing a regular job. Normally when you lose a job, it's not something you yourself desired. You never suddenly wanted to be cut off from your supply of stable income, it's just something that happened to you. But when you're the showrunner of a successful property that's making bank, the decision to end the show is one that you yourself have to make. And it can feel kind of crappy, purposefully stepping in and taking away something great from yourself, not to mention a ton of other people. So, stories are forced to continue solely for the purpose of making money, sacrificing quality to do so. And it creates a sort of paradox. The more seasons that a show is forcibly stretched out for, the more its audience realizes how much of a train wreck it's becoming, so they slowly but surely stop watching, meaning the show brings in less money. You're making worse content as an avenue to continue making money, but over time, as your content worsens, so does your profit. And yet, some stories just keep on going. Aside from money, from a creative standpoint, it's really disappointing when you see this happen, because you witness the slow, drawn-out death of something that was previously great. One example of this I can think of is The Office. The American version of The Office is a television classic, widely regarded as one of the best sitcoms of all time. It gave rise to a new kind of comedy, and while it didn't start the mockumentary trend, it definitely popularized it in American television. The first seven seasons of the show are incredible, damn near perfect even. The Office knew how to juggle its ensemble cast in a way that would make for the best comedy possible and it knew how to cook up situations that, while otherwise normal in our everyday lives, were stupid and outrageous in the show. A large part of that was the show's main character, Michael Scott, the bumbling manager of the Scranton branch of a paper company who's convinced he's the best boss in the world, while actually being little more than an awkward, sometimes idiotic goof who sorely lacks any maturity or self-awareness. The character of Michael is what made The Office work so well. He was the jumping off point into this world. He creates a lot of the situations that make this show so fun to watch. So, Michael's departure from the show in season 7 would have been the ideal time to end the show once and for all. The main character is no longer here, the show's drawing point is gone. And Michael's final episode is a damn good one at that. It perfectly balances humor with emotion, and it makes you feel like something big is coming to an end. They could have just finished it off then. But that's not what happened. Instead, The Office ran for two more seasons, and it never reached the same heights of quality as it had when Michael was still around. On top of that, it started doing some things that were just fundamentally wrong. The biggest thing that comes to mind is that plot point where Jim and Pam argue a bunch because Jim is tired of working a dead-end job he hates and takes on a new project on top of it. And in theory, this could be a good storyline to explore. Lots of people experience it. But the way it's presented in the show is tiring and exaggerated. Like, they're acting like they're gonna get a divorce over one rough patch, which is just not realistic, especially for a couple as beloved as them. The final two seasons of The Office don't hit the same way the first seven do. Don't get me wrong, I love The Office. Personally, it's one of my favorite shows, and I don't mind the last two seasons. But I'd be lying if I said they didn't dip in quality. So while The Office went on for longer than it needed to, I still consider it to be tame in the grand scheme of never-ending shows. The same cannot be said for something like Grey's Anatomy, which started airing in 2005, and 16 years and 18 seasons later is still running. Full disclosure, I've never seen a single episode of Grey's Anatomy, so I can't talk about it from a personal perspective, but I don't think it's a secret that the show isn't the most coherent at times. And like, 
duh! How are you supposed to write 18 seasons of a show and expect every season to be coherent within itself and within the larger scope of the show as a whole? It's just ridiculous. And Grey's Anatomy is not the only show that has an ungodly number of seasons for literally no reason, that all make less and less sense as they go on. The Big Bang Theory was seemingly universally disliked, yet it ran for 12 seasons. Gossip Girl had maybe one or two good seasons, but was stretched out to six and then later rebooted. Supernatural ran for 15 seasons over the course of 15 years, even though the show was supposedly only planned out for five, which apparently is very clear when watching it as it supposedly goes downhill from there. Again, I've never seen it, so please correct correct me if I'm wrong. The Flash is heading into its eighth season, even though only the first one was even semi-good. The Walking Dead, while having a fair number of great seasons, fell off years ago, but is still running its 11th season. Game of Thrones took a sharp turn in season 5, which only got worse and worse with each season, making for one of the most disappointing, not to mention infuriating, endings to what was once considered one of the best TV shows ever made. Although the downfall of Game of Thrones is more the fault of writers who no longer had a blueprint to work off of and likely got tired of the show and less on wanting to stretch the show past its prime. Quite the opposite, in fact, since Game of Thrones was probably one show that could have benefited from more seasons due to its sheer scale. And of course, the poster child for shows that have way too many seasons, none of which makes sense, is the CW's Riverdale, which currently has six seasons, even though it really didn't need more than one. In fact, when I say that Riverdale is the poster child for this phenomenon, I really mean it. Riverdale's existence embodies everything I'm talking about. The show was wildly popular when the first season came out, getting much more hype than anyone likely thought it would. Because of its unexpected success, the CW renewed it for more and more seasons, and it very quickly devolved into a nonsensical mess that, at this point in the game, couldn't makes sense even if it sold its soul to the devil in exchange for basic competence. From the Space Ninja has a feature film of a video discussing its shortcomings, and I highly recommend you check it out if you haven't already. The link will be in the description. So Riverdale is a mess that the showrunners are just milking dry, continually squeezing whatever last bits of story they can out of it, all while everyone who's involved in it resents it. Seriously, it's so clear that none of these actors like working on the show. You can tell just by looking at them. And yet, they're forced to work in a project they know is crap. Riverdale is a show that lacks lacks love, passion, and direction, all things that a successful show needs. There's no plan for it, no overarching storylines that allows for meaningful character development and exploration of themes. It exists solely to make money. It's truly the worst of the worst in this culture of never-ending stories. And there are some shows right now that are in the early stages of their downfall. Stranger Things' brilliant first season took the world by storm in 2016, making the show one of the most popular that Netflix released that year. Sounds like another show I've heard of. But its subsequent seasons, while still fun, didn't reach the same level of quality that its first did. And with its fourth season coming out soon, I can't help but wonder if it's even necessary. The show easily could have been a limited series, or it could have ended last season. It felt like the natural end anyway. Sex Education is another show that feels like it might be overstaying its welcome very soon. The first season of Sex Education was fantastic. It was a funny, heartfelt, realistic look at the way teenagers approach sex and sexuality, and it included really great and important representation and conversations that need to be had. Season 2 was a pretty strong extension of the first, but the third just didn't hit the same. It wasn't bad, but it's starting to get tired. You can feel it. But they renewed it for a fourth season, and I can't help but think it's only going to get more tired in the future. And it sucks. Because every show I mentioned started off great. There was a reason people enjoyed them, whether it be for the enticing plots, or the compelling characters, or the hard-hitting themes, or all three. But over time, if there isn't a plan for the series, it's easy for great things to sour, and it hurts. Falling out of love with a story hurts but it's become an unwelcome norm in our modern world. The never-ending story is a sickness that continues to plague us. But there are two sides to the coin. The opposite of the never-ending story is the story that is known, as in a story that is planned out from start to finish. Some of my favorite stories and some of the most critically acclaimed TV shows are ones whose creators knew, before they even wrote it, what exactly the story would entail. They knew about specific character arcs, knew what themes they wanted to explore and how, knew what direction different storylines would go in, and knew exactly how many episodes and seasons they would need to pull it off. While every second of every episode may not be planned out from the beginning, the roadmap was always there, aka the plan for how to get from point A to point Z. 
The most famous example that comes to mind is Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad is one of the best American television shows possibly ever produced, and a huge part of that was the work done by creator Vince Gilligan and his writers. The entire idea was simple. Mild-mannered chemistry teacher diagnosed with cancer eventually becomes the ruthless head of a meth empire. That was always the plan. So when they sat down to write it, everyone behind the show knew that the man we see in the pilot eventually has to become the man we see in the finale, and every decision they made in the show serves that transformation. And Breaking Bad did undergo some very dramatic changes throughout its run that were not originally planned for. For one thing, the character of Jesse Pinkman wasn't originally supposed to live past season 1, but after seeing how absolutely brilliant Aaron Paul was in the role, everyone knew he had to stay. And thank goodness he did, because the turbulent relationship between Walt and Jesse is one of the most compelling aspects of the show. The writer strike also changed some elements of the season 1 story arc, and Gus Fring was originally supposed to be a much smaller character than he ended up being. And again, thank goodness he stayed, because holy crap! So yeah, there were definitely aspects of the show that changed on the fly, but the writers embraced those changes and put in the work to properly thread them into the pre-planned story. On top of knowing the general direction the story was heading in, Vince Gilligan didn't push to keep the show going. He didn't milk it dry. He did quite the opposite, in fact. Breaking Bad ended in 2013 at the height of its popularity, and that's exactly how Gilligan wanted it. I pushed harder than anyone for Breaking Bad to end when it did. As someone making money on the show, in very crass, basic terms, I would have loved for it to go on forever. But I had worked on X-Files for years before that. For seven years, I was on it. Then, suddenly, I looked up one day and realized that everybody was watching something else entirely. I learned at that point, you don't want to leave the party too late. You want to leave folks wanting more. And that's exactly what he did. He knew the story he was telling, he knew where it would end, and he did the right thing by ending it on a good note, cementing it in television history as one of the best American shows out there. Another show that I just have to mention here is the German show Dark. Dark is an absolute masterclass in what good planning can do for a story. There is simply no way this story could have been written without hours of careful consideration of every aspect. And if you've seen the show, you know what I mean. It's succinct, it's intelligent, and it's comprehensible, which is a huge feat for a show that's one wrong step away from being a giant plot hole. On top of that, it's subtle yet complex, and it knows how to keep you engaged as it unravels the true reaches of its mystery. And just like Breaking Bad, creators Jansia Frieza and Baron Boodar had a set plan for Dark. The idea for the show was one they had been developing for almost eight years. The original idea was supposedly a crime drama they had written a couple years prior to being contacted by Netflix, but at the time, they were also considering a movie dealing with time travel, and rather than choosing just one to develop with Netflix, they smoked a bunch of weed and decided to do both. Now, obviously, I can't confirm they smoked a bunch of weed before writing Dark, but seriously, if you've seen the show, you understand that the only way to write whatever the hell this is is if you're either extremely high or just straight up god, and I'm willing to bet they're a little bit of both. All of that aside, Frieza and Odar knew from the start that the story would unfold over the course of three seasons. This was a very strict endpoint for them, brought on by witnessing the derailment of the show Lost, which was also originally planned for three seasons, but was then forcibly prolonged due to its success. Just like Gilligan with Breaking Bad, they ended dark despite its huge success, because the story was naturally over. They went out with a bang, and it made dark one of Netflix's best projects. There's a couple more shows in the same vein that I can list here. Fleabag and The End of the Effing World both ended after two seasons, Peaky Blinders is coming to an end after its sixth season, and Avatar The Last Airbender was three seasons and done. All four are incredible stories that didn't overstay their welcome. They came, they conquered, they left. They entered late and left early. What seems to be a trend with never-ending stories and their decline in quality is that many of them did start with a plan. Lost, Supernatural, The Walking Dead, Game of Thrones, all of them had a plan. It was only when they tried to extend the show past the plan, or in Game of Thrones' case when they ran out of the blueprint, that things started to go downhill. And it makes sense that that would happen. The writers, who spent all that time coming up with a roadmap for the show, now suddenly have to pull plot lines from thin air after their story had come to an end. And that's really hard. From a writer's perspective, the thought of restarting a story when I specifically wanted it to end at a certain point seems like a headache waiting to happen, especially when I think about creating a new character and story arcs after the main ones have already been fully realized. Like, if I'd wanted it to be a part of the story, then I would have written it into the original plan. And I understand that characters can continue changing and developing even after the meat of a story is over. Characters are people, after all, and people don't just stop growing after one specific portion of their lives. But for storytelling purposes, it's just hard to pull off, unless certain things were purposefully left unresolved in the main story. 
For example, Avatar The Last Airbender left one very important question unanswered in the show. What actually happened to Zuko's mother? It was the one element of the story that was deliberately left up in the air so that it could be answered in the graphic novels. In fact, the Avatar graphic novels are a great example of how to extend a story in a way that works. Avatar finished off after the Hundred Year War was ended by Aang and friends. Zuko was crowned Fire Lord, and he and Aang, with the help of Katara, Sokka, Toph, Suki, and Iroh, were going to take it upon themselves to fix the problems the Fire Nation created during the Hundred Year War. For all intents and purposes, Avatar had a happy, satisfying ending. It didn't necessarily need a continuation, but it got one, because when you think about it, fixing the problems left behind after the war is a huge undertaking. The aftermath of a war is never easy, and it makes for a great plot for an extension of the original show. On top of that, it opens the door for some further character development and conflict. Aang, the pacifist, wants all Fire Nation citizens living in colonies to return home to the Fire Nation, essentially decolonizing those areas. Zuko, realizing how many citizens call those places home after generations of residing there, doesn't think it's the right move, because either way, someone is going to be unhappy. It thrusts these new friends back into conflict and forces them to resolve the issue, no matter how ugly it gets. Throw on top of that Zuko's lasting trauma inflicted by his own father and the promise he made Aang make to kill him if he ever gets as bad as his father, and Aang's fundamental aversion to causing harm and taking lives, and you've got a rich and very necessary continuation of a story. Seriously, it never ceases to amaze me how incredible Avatar is as a property. It's a children's series, it literally has no business hitting this hard, and yet this level of quality is what you get when you have writers who know what the hell they're doing. Another great example of how a story could be extended is the movie El Camino, a continuation of Breaking Bad. The ending of Breaking Bad was bittersweet. Walt, who's lost everything at that point and has the cops after him, decides to get one last bit of revenge on the new Nazis who killed Hank and took Jesse captive. He rigs his car with a massive machine gun and turns up on their doorstep. At the last moment, he tackles Jesse, then sets the gun off, killing everyone in the room. Afterwards, Jesse is on the verge of killing Walt, which Walt wants, but tired of being Walt's loyal lapdog, Jesse refuses. The two of them leave the building, and Walt and Jesse give each other final, understanding nods before Jesse steals a car and drives off, crazed and disbelieving at his freedom. Walt gives his meth lab and his entire meth empire one last loving look before succumbing to his injuries, where he's found dead by the police. It's one hell of an ending, and for the most part, it wraps everything up. Walt and Hank are dead, Skylar and Walter Jr. have moved away and are awaiting Skylar's court date, Marie is still reeling from Hank's death. The only thing we don't know from the final episode is what ends up happening to Jesse. The last we see of him, he's driving away from Walt like a maniac, but he's still got police after him. From the show's ending alone, we never really find out what happens to him. That's where El Camino comes in. El Camino is the story of what happens to Jesse after all of this. It's the story of Jesse trying to leave his old life and start fresh. But it's not just an exciting action thriller. It's not just Jesse driving around like a maniac, waving around a gun, and getting enough money together to pay for his safety, although it does have all those things. El Camino is first and foremost a character study of Jesse. The final events of Breaking Bad were enough to change a person forever, and for Jesse, who was already dealing with his worsening mental health during the show, those events left him a broken shell of himself. El Camino is a study of his trauma and PTSD, and his struggle to move past it all. It tells the story of Jesse leaving his past both physically and mentally. And it makes perfect sense for this to be the extension of the show Gilligan went for. Jesse is probably one of the most sympathetic characters in all of Breaking Bad. When the series starts, he's just a kid, a small-time criminal who doesn't have a ton going for him. He's forced into the meth business by Walt, and the more Walt becomes Heisenberg, the more he drags Jesse down with him. Because you see, Jesse was never a bad person. Jesse never deserved anything that happened to him. He was a victim of circumstance, and that made him both sympathetic and tragic to viewers. That's why his story warranted a continuation. Because out of everyone in Breaking Bad, he was among the most screwed over characters, and El Camino addresses what happens when a good person has terrible things happen to them. El Camino addresses the lasting impact of trauma and gives viewers all they ever wanted for Jesse. Closure. And it's brilliant. Both Avatar and Breaking Bad are proof that it is possible to extend a story past its initial endpoint, if you have a good reason to, if you have a real story to tell. But things like Lost, Supernatural, The Walking Dead, Riverdale, etc, etc, didn't have a reason to do what they did other than making money, and it tainted the show. You can't watch the first good seasons of those shows without knowing the train wreck that's about to come. For all intents and purposes, those shows did not enter late and leave early, which is something they could have greatly benefited from. And that brings me back to Squid Game. Did you forget that that's what we were originally talking about? Don't worry, I don't blame you, I tend to be long-winded. Squid Game was a story that was well planned out, as far as I know. 
Writer-director Huang Dong-hyuk wrote the show as a limited series and always intended it for it to be just that, one season and done. He had a specific vision for the show and he pulled it off wonderfully. I don't think he ever expected the show to gain as much popularity as it did, and I get that. You see things like this happen to other people and other properties, but you never expect it to happen to you. And yet, the show absolutely took off. 1.65 billion hours of the show were viewed in the first 28 days, which is over double the first month viewership of the next most popular title, Bridgerton. Everybody was talking about it. Memes were all over the place. For a couple weeks, you couldn't go on the internet without seeing at least one Squid Game meme. YouTubers started recreating it, people started cosplaying as the characters, and it absolutely helped that Halloween was right around the corner since the show was a goldmine for Halloween costumes. The show got nominated for awards, Gotham's, SAG's, Golden Globes, among others. And if there's one thing we know about Hollywood award shows, it's that they usually skip over international media altogether. Squid Game's success was lightning in a bottle, so talks of a season two were always going to be on the table. And yes, the irony of a show critiquing excess wealth and capital- I got an email. And yes, the irony of a show critiquing excess wealth and capitalism that made Netflix, a multi-billion dollar corporation, massive amounts of money, and subsequently getting renewed for a second season that wasn't originally planned so it can make even more money, is not lost on me. That is hilarious. Life truly writes itself. But let's forget about that for a second and talk about the artistic integrity behind it. Here's the thing. I firmly believe that if a story has a plan, the smartest thing to do is to follow it. Breaking Bad had a plan. They followed it, and it resulted in a masterpiece. Dark had a plan. They followed it, and it resulted in a masterpiece. And side note, for something like Dark, not following the plan is asking for a disaster. If you've got a plan, why not just follow it? That's what plans are for. In terms of Squid Game, I think the show ended in a great place. The end of season 1 of Squid Game was kind of bleak. I mean, almost all our characters are dead, Gihan is traumatized, and the game will continue for more years to come, even after the death of Ilnam. And even though it seems like Gihan might try to see if he can do anything to stop it, the likelihood of that actually happening is slim. It's not exactly a nice ending, and it works wonderfully for the show. It feels like a realistic ending to something like this. Nobody wins, other than the VIPs who got to experience another year of entertainment. But it's not like adding another season would be entirely out of the question for Squid Game. Gihon's final actions can be construed as ambiguous, which can be an avenue for the continuation of the story. The major concern with another season, however, is if continuing the story will take away from what the first season did so well. For example, if we continue the story and Gihon does manage to take down the Squid Game, I feel like the impact to the story as a whole would be greatly cheapened. And don't get me wrong, I'm not against a stick it to the man revolution kind of story. Obviously not, seeing as I love the Hunger Games as much as I do. But there is a time and a place for that type of story, and Squid Game is not that. If it suddenly became that, it would be really weird, and we would unfortunately see the decline of the show. However, I think Huang Dong Hyuk understands that and wouldn't go down that route. So that asks the question. What route would he go down? What could season 2 of Squid Game explore that would be a satisfying story and not diminish the quality of the show? Well, there's a number of things left over from season 1 that could be interesting to explore further. I think the biggest thing that comes to mind is the fate of Junho. The last we see of him, he had gained evidence of the illegal activities going on in the Squid Games, and he had fought tooth and nail to get off that island and expose the operation. However, the pink suits and the front men are close on his heels, and the terrible reception in the area prevents him from actually sending any of that evidence and requesting backup. This leaves him facing the front men with no one knowing his location, and a single gun with a fast diminishing supply of bullets. And when the front man reveals his true identity to be Inho, Junho's brother, Brother, who is the main reason Junho even did all this, he's so torn and betrayed that he can't even react when Inho shoots him. He falls off a high cliff into water and is presumed dead by both the frontmen and the audience. But here's the thing, we never actually see his dead body, unlike all of the other characters who get offed in this show. No, his is the only death that we leave up to assumption, which led a lot of people to hope that he was still alive. After all, his bullet wound probably wouldn't be fatal, the bullet hit his arm. And whether or not someone could survive a fall from that height is a little more ambiguous, but the point is that without a confirmed dead body, there is a chance that Junho lived. And with a season 2 on the table, the chance of him being alive is even greater. A season 2 where Junho is still alive could make for an interesting story. He just got hit with the biggest sucker punch of his life, his brother enabling the deaths of hundreds of people year after year before promptly being shot by him. I think that's a great avenue for conflict and character development, not just for Junho, but for Inho as well. Speaking of Inho, his story is also one that could do with some exploring. How exactly did he become the frontman? Learning more about him could not only flesh him out as a character more, but offer us more development of Squid Game's major theme of class and wealth. How does a man go from participating in the Squid Game as a player to then overseeing the entire thing? 
But the one thing I think would make for an excellent second season of Squid Game is if Gihan and or Junho attempted once again to take down the operation and failed miserably. We already saw Junho try and fail once, so watching him try again, perhaps with more help this time from Gihan, sets up the audience to expect a different outcome, one where they actually succeed. Drop them into the behind the scenes of another year of the Squid Games, have them sleuth around and do the work to try to end this thing, all while we get to know new players who we will also become attached to. Make it seem like they may actually be able to get somewhere with it. Then, pull the rug out from under us and have them fail. It would be a major slap in the face, and the exact kind of bleakness we see reflected in the real world. Also, remember that bomb that's supposed to blow everything up if the need ever arose? Well, I wholeheartedly thought that that was being set up like a Chekhov's gun, and that it would go off at some point, but it never did, so I would really like to see that bomb go off at some point. Look, I'm obviously not writing Squid Game Season 2, I'm just worried that it won't live up to the first season, and because of that, retroactively sour that first season a little. No one wants to experience that. In the end, Squid Game works really well as a limited series. Just like a lot of shows before it, it had a plan and executed it successfully. And also like a lot of shows before it, its success has sparked a continuation, one that may not be entirely necessary. And that creates possibility for things to go very downhill very quickly. But if the Avatar graphic novels and El Camino have taught us anything, it's that a continuation to a story can be good if it's earned, if there's real work that goes into it. And I really hope Squid Game can do that. Otherwise, it may just be the newest entry into an ever-growing collection of television tragedies. Anyways, put Kim Taehyung in Squid Game Season 2.